Hello, my name is Anthony Kwan, the Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics Consultant here with the Los Angeles County Office of Education. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this very special webcast, giving you your first introduction to the California Math Curriculum Framework, recently adopted by the California State Board of Education. As many of you are aware, the Common Core State Standards were adopted in 2010, serving as the performance expectations of all students. They show what students are able to do or say by the end of each school year, but do not tell how students are to be taught. This is where the California Mathematics Framework fits. The frameworks serve as a curriculum guide for all educators, recommending best practices, among other areas that will lead to the mastery of the math content. Throughout this webcast, you will see three individuals who are very familiar with the Common Core State Standards for Mathematics and the new Mathematics Framework. I'd like to introduce my good friend and colleague, Dr. Kendall Brown, Executive Director of the California Math Projects. Hi, hey, Kendall. Thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. We will also hear from Ms. Susan Stickel, Chair of the Mathematics Curriculum Framework Committee and Sacramento County Deputy Superintendent of Schools. And finally, Mr. Bill Honig, Chair of the California Instructional Quality Commission and former State Superintendent of Public Instruction. We look forward to their input. The Instructional Quality Commission acts as an advisory body to the California State Board of Education on matters related to curriculum, instructional materials, and content standards. So I asked Bill to provide an overview of the mathematics framework adoption process and provide a state perspective about the impact it will have on the teaching and learning of mathematics. Let's go ahead and watch that clip now. Well, there's quite an extensive procedure. Um, the state board adopts the standards. They did that. Then they adopt a criteria um, for setting up a, um, a, a framework review, a mathematics framework review committee, and they, they select has to be a majority of teachers. And so the Instructional Quality Commission, which I'm the chair of, then organizes that process. It goes to this committee. They work on it. They did for uh, six, seven months. It then went out for six, came back to the IQC, went out for a 60-day review, came back for further revisions, went out for another 60-day review, and then finally went to the board and got approved. There were also focus groups around the state, um, four focus groups where teachers and others were involved. There was extensive review by um, the public, t uh, professionals, and by uh, people like Karen Fusan or Phil Darrow or Jason Zimba, people who were involved uh, with the design of the framework. Karen Fusan gave us chapter and verse. We took her 99% of her uh, proposals, so it's had a thorough review. We just heard the perspective from Bill Honick. Kendall, what do you see as the potential for the frameworks? Well, I think the framework has the potential to really change mathematics instruction in the state of California. Uh, since the implementation of No Child Left Behind and the assessments associated with that, so many te mathematics teachers have been focusing on building students' skills with computations and procedures. Uh, however, we found that students have been lacking in the areas of critical thinking and problem solving. And I believe that the Common Core State Standards in Mathematics and the framework uh, will change the way that mathematics instruction is delivered in the state to emphasize more of that critical thinking and problem solving that our students will need as they go into the real world. Thanks, Kendall. That's really interesting. Susan Stickle was chair of the Mathematics Curriculum Framework Committee and is currently the Sacramento County Deputy Superintendent of Schools. She was front and center in the development of the mathematics framework from the beginning, and so I asked if she would paint a picture of the design, format, and purpose of the framework and how she sees it impacting the teaching of the Common Core State Standards for Mathematics. Let me begin by saying that the framework is a wonderful document. Um, frameworks from early 60s have been excellent documents, but this document is com particularly important because the field, all of our school districts and teachers are trying to uh, implement the Common Core and the framework will assist with that greatly. But in answer to your question then, the purpose of the framework is basically to guide curriculum development and instruction. Uh, it's to assist teachers, it's to assist administrators in doing that work. And in this case, in particular, help them implement the Common Core Standards. The framework provides a context for implementing the standards and, and they, it provides guidelines for educators and the, 
the developers of instructional materials. The framework also assists educators, administrators, and parents in becoming increasingly familiar with the Common Core. The format or the design of the framework is essentially the design is a lot like the frameworks of the past. Um, there are some chapters that are consistent and have always been consistent in the framework. But in particular, because the Common Core is front and center with this framework, it is um, it includes a majority of the chapters that are either by grade level or course that provide a great deal of information to teachers about the Common Core standards at their grade level or in the course that they're teaching. They focus on three major principles that are in each and every chapter, and those are the concepts that are woven throughout the framework of focus, coherence, and rigor. The chapters also focus on the two types of mathematical standards, the standards for mathematical content and the standards for mathematical practice. Thus, the chapters also assist teachers and other audiences with the structure of the standards. And most importantly, they have a wealth of examples for teachers that strike at the level of rigor that's expected for a particular grade level or a particular course. They, um, if I was still a high school math teacher, which is how I began my career, um, I would find the chapters about the high school courses invaluable. There are outstanding resources. There, there is the thinking of a bunch of really smart educators and mathematical leaders in the state of California and how best to implement the Common Core in, in teachers' classrooms. So in addition, as always, and this is what's common to every framework, there's a chapter on universal access that does an excellent job of talking about meeting the needs with students with disabilities, uh, English learners. There's also a chapter on instructional strategies where there is a wealth of strategies and pedagogy that are recommended for teachers that are trying to implement the Common Core. There's a chapter on technology. And there's a chapter on assessment. And one of the things that you always find in a framework is the criteria for instructional materials. And that criteria was recently used when um, they examined and the State Board adopted over 30 series for K-8 mathematics Common Core implementation. So Kendall, based on what we've seen in the Common Core state standards and the framework, what can you tell us about the impact of the instructional shift and what are the implications at the middle school and high school levels? Specifically, what are the major issues in regards to algebra at the middle school and geometry at the high school? There are changes in the content standards uh, and so you'll see different uh, types of content that are in the uh, standards that hadn't been there before, like fractions on the number line at the elementary level and um, transformational geometry at the secondary level. But what the biggest change to uh, the teaching and learning of mathematics that comes with the framework are the standards for mathematical practice. And you'll see that these are uh, specific ways that students are supposed to engage in mathematics in their classrooms now. And so you'll see the first four are written there. And there we have the second four. So this is going to require that teachers uh, dramatically change the way that they uh, teach, the content that they cover, and the way that they engage students. So what about uh, this issue at the middle school with um, the whole Algebra 1 option? Okay, so um, previous, prior to the California Common Core Standards and the adoption of the framework, uh, eighth grade uh, algebra could be taught at uh, the eighth grade according to the previous set of standards. The way that the Common Core Standards have been written, um, algebra is seen as a course that is meant for ninth grade, uh, the first course in the college preparatory sequence. However, the way that the Common Core standards were written, uh, the eighth grade course 
uh, in the Common Core Standards is very different than what we've been used to. And in fact, a large part of it is what was in the first semester of the traditional algebra course. Uh, at, at the ninth grade level, what is called algebra now is more uh, topics that would, would be covered in the second semester of a traditional Algebra one course along with some other concepts. So uh, that is a huge change and that has begun discussions around uh, what do we do for students in middle school who are prepared for Algebra One? How do we uh, rearrange the courses? And what uh, the State Board of Education has said is that we will not create a special eighth grade algebra course. That if students are ready for algebra in the eighth grade, then they will take the same course that a student in high school would take. Uh, so that is going to mean uh, for those students who are prepared for algebra, who are ready to take algebra in the eighth grade, uh, the courses are going to have to be rearranged in the sixth and seventh grade to make sure that they get all the standards that they need to be successful. So basically, when it comes to the Common Core State Standards, as well as the recommendations of the framework, there is going to be uh, just the recommendation of following a sixth grade math course, seventh grade math course, eighth grade math course, because the eighth grade is essentially uh, heavy on the Algebra one concepts. Absolutely. Now, uh, in addition, uh, there's a lot more statistics that has been added to the middle school curriculum, and so uh, which a lot of teachers are unfamiliar with, and so there's going to be a need to make sure that teachers uh, get the training that they need to teach to those statistics. And actually, in the appendix of the framework, uh, there's uh, a section on acceleration. How do you co uh, compact three years of content into two years to make sure that the students are ready for uh, that algebra course mm -hmm. and they don't miss any of the standards that they should have gotten because you're accelerating them. Now when it comes to the geometry at the high school, uh, I, I believe that there have been controversial issues around mm -hmm. that whole geometry uh, basically of students aren't ready for geometry so we're not offering those geometry courses. You know that's traditionally been a problem. Geometry seems to get short shrift in the high school uh, college preparatory sequence but um, Geometry is very important because as students go on to trigonometry and math analysis, they're going to need a lot of those concepts that were taught in the traditional geometry course. So um, I think uh, teachers need to be very careful not to uh, eliminate any of those important concepts in geometry to make sure the students are prepared for um, you know whatever courses that they take as they advance through the college preparatory sequence. And wouldn't you also say that it's true that when it comes to the geometry there is a heavy focus at the elementary levels going up through the grade levels? Right, there is the a lot of emphasis on geometry. Again, there is a shift in the way the geometry is being taught uh, to a more transformational approach, which is, again, new for a lot of teachers. So, mm -hmm. again, that's going to require a lot of training and support for teachers to be able to teach that well. So, Kendall, what can we expect to learn from the section on assessments and universal access? Um, well, the assessments are going to be changing. We've been used to, in the era of No, era of no Child Left Behind, uh, primarily multiple choice standardized tests. Um, the new uh, test items that we've seen uh, from the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium also contain constructed response items as well as extended response items. And I think we have an example in the PowerPoint of a sample released item from the Smarter Balanced Assessment. And so in this particular uh, mathematical task, uh, we have a scenario where you have a group of 75 people who need to take taxis from their hotel to the airport. You have taxis that can accommodate a group of nine people or a group of uh, six people, and they are both uh, charged different amounts. And so you have to figure out um, what is the least expensive way to get all 75 people to the airport given those different variables. Uh, very different than um, performing some kind of computation and then choosing an answer from four multiple choice questions. So that's going to require a different type of instruction to prepare students. So with this type of an assessment then, what are its impact for our English learners, our special ed students? Well, that's going to mean that we're going to have to 
pay uh, very close attention to scaffolding the instruction for these particular students. And so if we take a look again at the PowerPoint, we'll see that uh, we're going to have to work a lot with teachers in terms of engaging students with literacy strategies like the use of graphic organizers or um, discourse strategies where we uh, work with students to get them to communicate their ideas mathematically. Again, these are uh, new types of instructional strategies that many math teachers aren't used to um, uh, engaging their students in. We're, uh, we've been in a, uh, an era where it's about very teacher-centered instruction, where the teacher lectures, the students take notes, and then they engage in the mathematics. If we want them to perform on those kinds of assessments, then we're going to have to engage them differently. We also need to work very closely with um, developing uh, strategies for student interaction. So how do we group students? When is it appropriate to work with them uh, as a whole class? Uh, when is it appropriate for them to work in small groups or in partner pairs? And again, what are some cooperative, specific cooperative learning strategies that we can share with mathematics teachers to help them engage students collaboratively? So you may actually have some pushback on that in terms of, well, this, all this is great, but it's going to take too much time in our classrooms. Well, the issue and one of the things that um, Sue Stickle talked about was this move towards um, coherence and rigor so that we're teaching fewer topics more in depth so uh, we should have time to be able to make those connections and instead of thinking of instruction as teaching one standard and then teaching another standard and then teaching the next standard we need to look at what kinds of concepts that we're teaching and what kind of tasks can we engage these students in that cover multiple standards uh, you know, across the different domains and content areas. So we're really uh, emphasizing the need for contextualizing all of those concepts so that students are able to access the learnings from the mathematics. Absolutely. In the real world, students take whatever mathematics that they know to solve the problems that they need to in their work uh, environment, in their everyday life. And so that's what we want to model in the classroom, that we teach them all of these different mathematical concepts and then we give them a task where they have to draw on those concepts in order to solve the problem. Let's pause for a moment and give some attention to the elephant in the room. The traditional versus integrated pathways to mathematics at the high school level. There's been lots of discussion about this in districts. Let's turn to Susan Stickle and Bill Honig again to get their thoughts. I asked Sue to share her thoughts on the main differences between the traditional and the integrated pathways and what she sees as the implications for teaching and learning for each. So let me begin by saying, again, the framework will offer great advice in this area. The framework um, have the chapters that are organized into, into the two pathways. You'll see a al chapter about Algebra 1. You'll see a chapter about Mathematics 1. The very first thing that you need to realize, and I think this is different than in the past, is whether you're traveling an integrated pathway or you're traveling a traditional pathway in the delivery of your instruction, the standards that you will cover at the end of the day are the same. No standards get left out in either pathway. Um, so for parents that are concerned if you, if you tackle integration instead of, tra of traditional, they need to know the same content is going to be covered. It's just going to be rearranged. And the other thing that's important to note, and this is extremely important to teachers and to parents, is that both pathways, work is being done to ensure that both pathways are A to G improved and through the UC system. But if you talk about traditional, that's your basic, that's your, your classic, that's your Algebra 1, your Geometry, your Algebra 2. Um, but even if you look at the content of those courses, if you, for instance, if you look at Algebra 1, it is not the standards of the past. It is not the Algebra 1 that we've tackled in the past. In this case, in a traditional pathway, the Algebra 1 course, for instance, would also include geometry. It would include Algebra 2. And it would include some statistics in addition to some of what would be traditional Algebra 1 content. Besides greater depth in teaching, um, the content is a little different. 
and the integrated pathway, and those are mathematics one, two, and three. I catchy little catchy little names. Um, the what's wonderful about them are the standards in each of the clusters in the secondary uh, component. They each of those three courses use standards from all six clusters, so that a math one student might focus on linear functions and contrast them with exponential functions, solve linear equations and model functions, so that you're traveling up and down and in and out of the different clusters. And it's important to note that with the um, integrated pathway, most of the higher performing countries in our, you know, in the world actually use an integrated pathway. So um, districts are tackling this question right now. Some of them have already decided, and in fact, more often they are leaning towards the integrated pathway. But in the end, whatever decision they make, what they're gonna need to do is make sure that they have and include parents in the, situ in the, in the decision making, along with teachers, along with school leadership. Uh, parents need to understand what the decision is and what's included because they can become your best advocates. And so communication is extremely important in that decision. The other thing that will be important in whatever pathway that uh, you go down will be the professional development. The professional development will uh, is vital and it's vital for all of the common core in this framework, but if you're tackling a new uh, pathway, for instance, if you've always been on a traditional pathway, and now you're going to go integrated, having your teachers and your school leaders have a lot of training is vital. Final point here is that there is a chapter which I'd like to suggest people um, read also, and that's the appendix that talks about acceleration issues. Because on the one hand, you don't, uh, uh, on the one hand, and, and this is mainly middle grades and, and going into high school, on the one hand, um, you should, people should know that the Common Core eighth grade course is somewhat integrated in the in the sense that it it includes about a third to a half of what we normal what we used to teach or are teaching now or previously taught in high school algebra. So you get a big hunk of algebra in eighth grade. But for those that want to accelerate faster than that, um, there are suggested ways of doing that, and there's several ways um, you can think through that problem. On the one hand, you don't want to put students in a course they're not ready for so that they don't do well. The research is pretty clear that that kind of kills their math career. On the other hand, those that can handle it, you want to be able to give them uh, the opportunity to do it. And that kind of judgment is being made locally in many districts now. And there's a lot of good thought about that. So, Kendall, is there anything else that needs to be added or mentioned? You know, I think about a couple of things uh, that um, Sue Stickle said uh, regarding the integrated program. I think it's really important just to stress the point that the same contents uh, standards are covered whether you take an integrated pathway or a traditional pathway. In the 90s, we ran into this huge problem. That was the first time that integrated courses had been widely introduced in the state of California. And there was this impression among parents that the traditional program was for students who were on a college prep core, uh, pathway and that the integrated pathway was uh, for students who didn't necessarily want to go on to um, college or career, uh, go, go on to college, and that it did not meet the A through G requirements. And I think it's just uh, important to reemphasize the fact that integrated courses are equivalent to the traditional courses and they do uh, prepare students for college and so I think that's important. The second thing was the whole um, issue that Bill raised around professional development. There's a huge need for professional development around the Common Core Standards. On the one hand teachers are going to need to increase their content knowledge uh, to teach the uh, content standards that have been changed. Uh, teachers are going to need um, professional development around changing their pedagogy to meet the standards for mathematical practice. And then teachers are going to need access to high quality uh, resources that are out there that they can then take and adapt for instruction in their classrooms. 
And so when it comes to the eighth grade portion, since, since it's already at an integrated level, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it, to try to follow along uh, that same integrative coursework in the high schools? Well, I mean, you know, I think it's really up to schools and, and teachers and, and parents to come to that decision uh, to meet the needs in their own local context. Um, I just want to make sure that people understand that they are both very viable uh, pathways that a student can take. They'll be successful no matter which pathway that they take, and so parents shouldn't be afraid of one or the other. Sue also made a, a really important statement that no standards are left out. Any additional thoughts on no, that? No, I, I uh, wholeheartedly agree with that, and I think that's something that we really need to emphasize as well to so that parents, students, um, colleges that are accepting students, uh, admissions officers understand that all the standards are covered no matter which pathway you choose. So during an earlier conversation with Bill, he had some interesting things to say about how the framework should be used by California educators. Kendall, I'd like you to respond to his comments as I feel he makes a really important point here. The state framework is really a guidelines for the development of curriculum at the local level. That's yeah, the missing interim step between standards and lesson plans and units. Um, and it's, very, it's a very important piece of work. Um, there's an article that uh, you can get the link to, was done by, for EdSource um, on January 29th, which basically sit, talks about the importance of that and then gives you a tremendous amount of resources uh, to basically help in that effort. The framework is obviously number one. But there are other states that have uh, scope and sequence and uh, 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 frameworks for, um, for curriculum and instruction. There are uh, places such as Long Beach that have done this. There are sites such as Bill McCollum's progression document, which was very influential in the design of the framework. I do want to say something about the framework itself. Um, there, it's it's, it's organized, as Sue has said, on math practice standards combined with the content standards, but there are a lot uh, less topics and they go in a lot deeper. And what the framework does is give you some advice on how to go into that. For example, it says for seventh grade, use proportion to solve, uh, use proportional thinking to solve problems. That's an end product. How much time does it take to get most students there? What are the strategies to use? That's what the framework helps advise you on. They were books adopted, uh, 31 uh, 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 instructional materials were adopted uh, just recently by the state board. They have a scope and sequence behind them. They show you how much time they've adopted, uh, devoted to it. But also now that we have open source material um, and you can integrate, mix and match and really come up with a pretty good uh, mix of, of, of high quality strategies, that's a, that's a job that can be done locally also. There's some good stuff out there now, um, and we were very proud of the books. They, they, they seem to be going along with what the standards uh, and the framework um, suggest, and the framework was used, the draft framework was used in deciding which of these books met the standards and met the framework. So those are all very useful. Uh, I would agree with Bill that there are a lot of resources that are out there for teachers, uh, for parents, and for professional development providers. For example, the uh, California Department of Education on its Brokers of Expertise website has uh, created a number of professional learning modules that uh, teachers can go on by themselves or in groups and learn about the different aspects of all of the different frameworks, but specifically for mathematics, the progressions and the standards for mathematical practice. You have websites like Inside uh, Mathematics that not only has mathematical tasks, but also has videos and lesson plans and examples of student work to accompany. You have the Illustrative Mathematics Project that uh, teachers and um, sites are using to upload tasks that are broken down by grade level, by um, strand, by content cluster, and by domain for teachers to access. 
uh, at our own website uh, for the California Mathematics Project, we put together professional development resources focusing on those areas of the standards that are relatively new, like fractions on the number line, transformational geometry, and mathematical modeling. So I would agree that uh, it's not necessary for teachers to write curriculum and reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of resources already out there that they can take advantage of. There's also um, other resources available through our professional organizations like uh, the California Math Account, uh, Council, um, NCTM, um, and with those, do we really need to de rely on those instructional materials? I think it's important that um, schools choose whatever instructional materials that they feel are going to best meet the needs of their students, but they should also uh, be open to looking at other resources that are out there uh, that can supplement uh, whatever instructional materials that they have and that also meet the needs of their specific students because uh, these instructional materials are written for a general population, but we know when we get into individual schools, um, we have to deal with the population of students that we have, whether or not um, they are high achieving students, gifted students, students with special special needs, second language learners, students who have significant gaps in their learning. And so um, I think these other resources can help fill those gaps. So I think the real clear message here is that the instruction materials are there as resources, but we shouldn't be wholly dependent on them because there are all these myriad of um, resources available to us. Absolutely, and, and each school exists within its own context. I respect teachers. Uh, enough that they know their students, they know the communities that they're dealing with, so they're probably in the best position to decide what kind of resources are going to work best with the students that they work with. Before we leave, let's hear about final thoughts. We'll start with Sue and Bill. Well, I, you know, the final thought would be um, to read it cover to cover, first of all. Um, it is broken up into nice chunks. Um, it is, um, I think, it is your best tool to become completely familiar with the Common Core, and it is your best tool in helping you integrate the Common Core. There's one other point I'd, I'd like to stress, and that is that the standards and the framework envision a much more active classroom. Teachers get this. When they see the test items, uh, potential test items from Smarter Balance, or look at the framework, or have a professional development session, they get right away that this means uh, much more questioning, uh, integration of modeling, posing a tough question, a math talk, having youngsters deal with that and come back and report to the classroom. Um, that's, a, that's a major shift for many of us. And it means that we're going to have to um, invest quite a bit in professional development and the idea of continuous improvement. I'm going to try something out. I want you to come in and watch it. I want to talk about whether it worked or didn't work and where we can make it better. Um, so it's a more active classroom and a more active uh, engagement and interaction of the teaching force with each other during the school day or during the school week. Um, all that is envisioned by the framework and I think that's where we need to go. People have been saying that for years. Now we have a chance of really moving in that direction. This is not we have to do this tomorrow. This is a 10 to 20 year effort to get to what that, these frameworks uh, and standards are talking about. And given enough time and support, I think we're going to be able to get there. I would agree with both Bill and Sue that I think we have um, a really great opportunity with the framework and standards to um, change inst mathematics instruction in the state of California so that we can see more and more um, students who graduate from California public schools having a positive mathematics identity that can go out and pursue uh, STEM careers uh, or the, uh, further their education but it's going to take a concerted effort on prof uh, by professional development providers, by teachers, by administrators, by parents, and by students to make this work. So I want to take this opportunity to thank Bill Honig, Sue Stickle, and our in-studio guest, Kendall Brown, for sharing their insights about the California Mathematics Curriculum Framework. Today's program would not have happened without a wonderful tech crew here at LACO, led by Tyler Cook. 
I also want to thank the Division of Curriculum and Instructional Services, led by Reynette Sanchez and Yvonne Contreras, for their wonderful support and leadership. This introduction on the new state frameworks is just the first step of many more modules to come. As we continue to move forward in the implementation of the Common Core State Standards for Mathematics, please be sure to check our website at laco.edu for more information as the year progresses. The Los Angeles County Office of Education will soon post a Mathematics Curriculum Toolkit webcast with resources to help you make informed decisions about the instructional materials you may want to select for your district. You can also find information and resources at the California Math Project led by Dr. Kendall Brown at http forward slash www.cmpso.org and of course the California Department of Education has plenty of resources at cde.ca.gov. Finally, let me leave you with this last thought from an early German physicist, Georg Lichtenberg. I cannot say whether things will get better if we change. What I can say is they must change if they are to get better. Once again, thank you for joining us. <laughs>